uh, diving deeper into Hu Honua uh, here on ThinkTech, uh, Energy 808, the cutting edge, uh, with uh, Paula Dobin, Dobbin, correct me if I'm wrong, Dobbin, is it? Dobbin. Dobbin, of Civil Beat. We love Civil Beat. And after the story that she wrote a few days ago, uh, many stories that she wrote about Hu Honua, we love Paula, too, for her investigative reporting. So, um, Marco, you're our co-host here in this matter. Uh, it would be appropriate, Marco, if you introduced Paula. Uh, Marco Mangelsdorf will now introduce Paula Dobbin. Well, somebody from uh, a Big Buddha, also known as Luang Prabang Lao People's Democratic Republic. So thanks so much for having me on again, Jay, from, from afar. And, and thank you especially, Paula, for agreeing to be on the show with us. Uh, you have done, in my view, just a superlative job over the past year with multiple pieces covering the Huhonua saga. Uh, which has been going on for for a long, long time, and I'm I'm just very appreciative of you, and very appreciative of Civil Beat, and uh, doing the work that you're doing, and especially uh, the two recent pieces. Uh, the last, uh, the most recent article being the one you wrote on the issues, challenges, problems that Huonua has had with uh, various permitting uh, permits uh, there at the site, and then the one prior to that being the in-depth piece you did on uh, Kevin Johnson, Jennifer Johnson, and some of the uh, individuals involved, very closely involved with Duhonua. So uh, again, kudos to your great reporting, Paula. Thanks so much uh, again for being on with us. And uh, Jay, back to you. Okay. Hey, Paula, thank you for coming around. It was a really nice article. It was an example of investigative reporting, uh, you know, in the state scene, very important that we have that reporting. It's important to the state. Uh, for many reasons. And so we appreciate what you've done, what you wrote, and of course, the work you did in, 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 in the reporting itself. Um, this is an important topic. I'm sure you will agree. And the question is, uh, first, my first question to you is, how important is it in the larger scene of energy in Hawaii? Energy is important. This article is important. How important is it? What's happening with Huhonua? Um, well, who knew is a closely watched energy project um, that's been struggling to get off the ground for many years, as you know. Um, it hit some serious setbacks this year when the PUC uh, rejected its application for uh, an amended power purchase agreement to sell energy to Hawaiian Electric. Um, and they have uh, appealed that decision to the Supreme Court of Hawaii Um as it stands right now, you know, briefs have been submitted. There'll be oral arguments after the beginning of the year, most likely. Um, so, you know, it, it continues to be litigated. It's just a very seemingly contentious project um, that's been going on and on, you know, for many years at this point. Um, but I think what's significant is just how how high energy costs are on this island. And, um, you know, there is an, a big effort underway to move away from fossil fuels. So, you know, the supporters of the project say that, like, this, this plant, if it ever goes into operation, will help, you know, ease Hawaii's transition away from fossil fuels. Um, but there's, you know, a significant amount of um, opponents that say there's just too many problems with the plant, you know, that it's just not viable. So um, it's a closely watched story. I, whenever I write one of these stories, we get a lot of reader feedback. Um, so clearly the public is, is tracking this pretty closely. And you know, I've been asked to do that for Civil Beat, so I was really happy to, you know, be able to cover this. And uh, thank you very much for having me on the show and, um, you know, bringing this to the forefront. What kind of feedback do you get on these stories? I'm wondering, you know, in general, what the public says to you about these stories when they give you feedback. I mean, most of the most of the comments tend to be critical of Huhonua. I mean, there are some people that write in and and you know wonder why this this project has been so embattled. But um, you know, it, it seems like most of the comments we get are just kind of questioning, like you know, why is this continuing to to get you know pushed forward by um, the backers of Huhonua? Um, so th there's just 
there's so many different questions about the project, you know, whether it's the greenhouse gas emissions or, you know, the, the potential discharges into the ocean or, you know, just a lot of environmental stuff. And then, of course, like the cost of the energy itself. Um, you know, the PUC found that if if the a permit were granted, you know, it would actually raise people's electric bills by almost eleven dollars per month. So there's there's a lot of you know skepticism that this is really in the best interest of the public. Um, so it's just uh, it's just a multifaceted story, and we get a lot of of feedback whenever one of these stories appears on our website. Oh sure. So what was remarkable about the story when I started reading it? So I'm like, God, you know, this is a uh... An extraordinary thing that uh, Paula is reporting about um, a, a visit by um, uh, Kevin Johnson, who is an erstwhile lobbyist for Huhonua, um, who visits um, Jennifer Potter, one of the three PUC commissioners. And that was uh, key. You know, we we always like steer clear of talking to commissioners about cases they might be involved in, and they in turn, steer clear about talking to anybody about those cases. But here you reported on a fellow who uh, walked in on her and uh, talked to her about it and try to, you know, uh, convince her about um, the the correctness, uh, the, the value of, of this project. Um, that was extraordinary. How, how did you do the reporting on that? Because, like, you know, when I read that part of the story, it fell off my chair. Um, well, you know, I was, I was assigned to do the story and I started looking through the court record. Um, you know, there is a lawsuit that was settled last year that I think it was the summer of 2021. It was a lawsuit between, um, the main investor in the project, Jennifer Johnson and her original partner, uh, Harold Rob Robinson, and, and she had fired him and he had, you know, filed this wrongful, wrongful termination lawsuit. He was seeking to get damages. And um, so, you know, when you read through that, um, you know, voluminous case record, you know, we we just came across like the fact that this guy, Kevin Johnson, was involved with the Who Onua project. And um, honestly, I didn't know who Kevin Johnson was. My editor on the project did. He's from California. He lived in Sacramento. So, you know, he knew that he knew who Kevin Johnson was, uh, you know, this former NBA all-star and um, two-time mayor of Sacramento. And, and it really caught his eyes. Like, he was like, why is Kevin Johnson, you know, in Hawaii trying to plug this Who Honua project? So he, he just asked me to look into it. And um, so, you know, I just started doing some research about who Kevin Johnson is and then trying to, you know, talk to various people about, hey, have you had contact with Kevin Johnson or does that name ring a bell? And, you know, just just through the reporting, um, you know, I learned that that he had actually approached the PUC, um, namely Jennifer Potter. And, you uh, you know, I, I just reached out to her. I said, hey, um, you know, would you be willing to talk to me about this um, alleged visit that you had from Kevin Johnson? And and so she she did. She talked to me. This was it was like the final week, I think, of her tenure on the PUC. Um, but, yeah, she just kind of described how, you know, she had just started at the commission and she was like a month into the job and. All of a sudden, like her, the admin person, you know, called her up and said, hey, there's a guy named Kevin Johnson here. Do you want to let him? Should I let him in? She was like, yeah, sure, whatever. You know, she didn't know who he was either. And then, um, you know, he walked in and sat down and and kind of described who he was. And she was like, oh, OK, wow, this is this is like this, you know like high level guy who's, um, you know, here to talk to me. She was initially, you know, kind of like wowed by the whole thing and wasn't, you know, thinking like, wow, this, maybe I shouldn't be talking to this guy. Cause she was so really new, you know, she didn't know all the rules about ex parte communications. And, uh, but after the conversation was over, she did, you know, uh, report it to the chief counsel um, of the PUC who said like, no, you can't be talking to this guy. 
Um, you know, even at the at the time, the docket was officially closed, um, but you know, it was it was a pending matter before the Supreme Court, so it was you know very likely it was going to come back to the PUC, and and so you know, it was just kind of an ethical breach. Like you really you should not be talking to um, you know parties to litigation or to an, you know one of these P, these PUC cases if the matter is likely to come back to you. So anyway, I mean, long story short, he he did that. And then he subsequently, you know, emailed and and voicemailed her and, you know, just was trying to get her to, um, you know, get her support for the project because her vote was really crucial. You know, the, the PUC is only a three member body. And um, it was, uh, you know, he might have known at that point that the chair, um, Jay Griffin, was not really a big fan of Huonua. And so, you know, in order to get two of the three commissioners to vote in favor, he really needed her. So she was key to his um, lobbying efforts. And that was uh, that was followed by a letter from the attorney general of the state to Kevin Johnson. You reported on that, too. Uh, and you called the letter, and I quote, a light. Um, what, what, why do we stress the word polite here? Um, well, if you read it, you know, it was kind of polite. It was like, Hey, you know, probably, uh, it would not look really good if the public knew that Kevin Johnson was, you know, meeting with a, a commissioner of the PUC that maybe, you know, voting on this on this project. So, um, you know, sorry if she doesn't return his phone calls anymore. I mean, I'm sort of paraphrasing here, but, um, you know, it wasn't like a formal, you shall not do this, but it, it was just kind of worded in like, hey, you know, like back off kind of thing. Yeah. I understand that customarily a letter like that, you know, raising an ethical issue like that uh, would have mm -hmm. gone to all the parties in the case. And there were plenty of parties on this docket you know whether it did go to all the parties in the case or was it just private between the attorney general and Kevin Johnson? Well, it went to the lawyers for who knew it didn't go to Kevin Johnson himself. Um, as far as I know, it just went to those attorneys. It, it wasn't, as far as I know, technically considered an ex parte communication because the docket was officially closed at that period of time. If he had done, if he had gone to her and knocked on the door and said, "Hey, I want to talk to you about Huhunua," and and if it had been an active, um, you know, docket, then clearly that would have been, you know, no question an ex parte communication, and they would have had to have notified all the parties. You know, it would be part of the public record. But I, you know, my understanding is because the docket was closed, um, they didn't have to do that. Yeah, well, that may be a, a difference without a distinction in the sense that everybody knew that if the Supreme Court remanded it, it would come right back to the three commissioners as it had before. No? Um, yeah. The other, the other remarkable uh, thing that is that you, you had, uh, you, you, your reporting included uh, a, a, I guess it was a telephone call with uh, Jennifer Johnson, uh, the CEO of uh, Franklin Templeton, which is worth $1.5 trillion. And um, she's a very wealthy woman, and she's the one behind the project. Uh, how did you achieve that? That's, that's hard for any reporter, isn't it, getting to somebody like that? I mean, it's kind of the luck of the draw, you know, sometimes people are up for it and sometimes they're not. Um, I had I had initially asked, you know, the PR firm representing who knew that I wanted to interview her and, and um, you know, it didn't seem likely that that was going to happen. You know, they, they didn't really encourage it. Um, but then when I was looking through the court file for that lawsuit in California, I came across her personal email. It was in one of the um, the filings. So I was like, well, you know, what the heck, I'll, you know, I'll just reach out to her on her Gmail account and uh, say, hey, you know, I'm a reporter for Civil Beat. You know, I've been covering Huhonua. I like we'll be covering it, you know, going forward. And, you know, I forget exactly what I said, but I mean, I was trying to impress upon her that, you know, there's a lot of per there's a lot of um, public interest in this. And from what I could tell, just by looking at old news articles, there really wasn't much um 
you know, mention of her. Like I didn't see a lot of articles with her on the ground in Hilo or, or anything like that. And, you know, so I, I said, you know, you, you kind of are like this mystery person, at least that's what I felt. And, you know, given how um, this is a project with high, a high level of public interest, would you, you know, care to say anything to me? Because I'm, I am writing about, you know, Kevin Johnson. I'm just trying to let people know like what he was doing and, and, um, Soon thereafter, I got, um, you know, a call from the PR firm saying that yeah, she was actually interested in doing it. And uh, we set it up for a few couple of weeks from then, I think. And, um, you know, I appreciate the fact that she made herself available. It was it was I think it was important to the story. Um, and it was it was just good to hear her thoughts on the project. Yeah. And um, did you discuss with her, you know, why Kevin Johnson? I mean, after all, basketball player. Mm popular fellow, used his popularity to get to be mayor of Sacramento. Um, to my knowledge, to my understanding, reading a story that he had no background in energy, for example, uh, or for that matter, in energy in Hawaii. Um, but uh, she she had selected him, and I guess she thought pretty highly of him. What, what was that about? Yeah, I mean, they're personal friends. Um, she told me that, you know, they had met at a San Francisco Giants game. Her dad is like the majority shareholder of the Giants, from what I recall. And, you know, the her, Franklin Templeton has a campus up in uh, Sacramento. And, you know, they, they just became friends. He talked to some of her employees a couple of times. He went to some of her, one of her kids' basketball practices and and I think, you know, she thinks really highly of his capabilities. And, um, you know, he he apparently offered to help her out. You know, she described the difficulties that she was having with, um, you know, getting Huhonua permitted and into operation. And so he offered to, you know, use his skills as a charismatic guy and, um, you know, somebody who can put together deals because, you know, he had... I guess, prevented the Sacramento Kings from being moved to Seattle, like he got a stadium built or something. I don't know all the details of it, but, you know, he had some experience as mayor of Sacramento putting together um, deals that involved, you know, lots of different parties, lots of different money and things like that. And so, you know, he came on the scene in, I think it was January of 2017 to replace this other guy that she fired. Um, to be like kind of the project manager, like Kevin was tasked with like, you know, building bridges with any influential person that could try to get this project permitted. And so that's what he's been doing, you know, since January of 2017. And presumably still today doing, no? Yeah, as far as, I mean, she said that he, she's very grateful for his work and his wife. His wife is also involved, Michelle Ree. Um, she's a consultant who works on um, exploring like tax credits and, you know, how tax credits could attract uh, outside investors to the project. Um, she's she's an interesting person in her, her own right. She's like a former D.C. chancellor of the school system there and uh, an education reform ad advocate, a little bit controversial in her own right, like Kevin is. Um, and uh, so what's, what's yeah, controversial both, about Kevin? Kevin, um, he's been alleged to, you know, have had um, inappropriate sexual contact with um, with certain minors, I believe. I'm not entirely sure. I didn't really dig deep into those allegations because those have been, you know, reported quite extensively. Um, no charges have ever been filed against him, and he denies any wrongdoing whatsoever. Mm -hmm. You know, one of the things in your story I was interested in is that you mentioned that he started doing this in 2017. Uh, which is what mm, mm, quite a few years ago, actually. Uh, hate to say how how fast time goes, um, but in fact, he he didn't uh, he didn't register as a lobbyist in the state of Hawaii until mm, this past spring, uh, roughly what uh, six months or less ago. Um, and I guess he was not a lobbyist prior to that time. Was was uh, uh, his wife a lobbyist? Uh, she's not registered as, as far as I know, as a lobbyist here. Um, and as to why he registered last April, nobody seems to really know. Um, both Warren Lee, the president of Huhonua, which is also called Honua Ola Bioenergy, um, both Warren and Jennifer Johnson both said that you know, Kevin's role hasn't really changed over the years. Um, so why he registered as a lobbyist in April, um, 
it's hard to know. And and he, he declined to speak with me on the phone. Um, so I wasn't able to ask him directly. Mm -hmm. But you did find out, and it's one of the remarkable things in your, in your reporting, uh, the number of people, the individual people uh, in state government and county government that he had approached and, and tried to uh, gain support from for this project. It was, may I say, prodigious. Uh, and of course, your efforts were prodigious in getting the names of all those individuals. It seemed like dozens and dozens. He left no stone unturned. Am I right? Um, well, I, you know, who knows the extent of the, you know, the outreach he did. I was only able to document, you know, some of it. And um, but the ones that I was able to confirm that he was lobbying um, were like the state energy officer, um, the the top. Um, business and economic development uh, director, the consumer advocate, uh, the mayor of the Big Island, county council members, uh, chambers of commerce, um, you know, and he held community meetings. Um, you know, I wasn't able to document specifically his contacts with some of these lawmakers, but there are there is one photograph that we came across on Ron Kochi's, um, the Senate president's website, or I'm sorry, his Facebook page of him with Jennifer Johnson and Rob Robinson, um, the guy who Jennifer fired and brought Kevin in to replace. Um, so we, we know that they met with, with Ron Kochi. Um, you know, I reached out to some senators like uh, Glenn Wakai and Donovan Dela Cruz and Ron Kochi just to ask them, like, you know, was was Kevin lobbying you guys to try to, you know, introduce legislation that would benefit Huhonua? Um, and they all said that they were not lobbied by him. Um, so, you know, I, you I don't know. Independent information to that effect, though. He was What's approaching that? all the, he was approaching all these people, including a number of legislators. I, I, I get I get that from your article. But did you have independent, um, you know, confirmation of the fact that he that it wasn't just a friendly visit, it was more, and that he was oh. trying to get them to support the project? Well, definitely. I mean, when, when it comes to, like, the energy officer, the consumer advocate, and um, the director of um, the department of, um, I don't know the full acronym, but it's like the business development, Mike McCartney, um, they all confirmed that, yeah, I mean, they had multiple meetings with him. Well, I wasn't able, actually, to talk with Dean Nishina, the consumer advocate. He, he he didn't flat out decline to talk with me, but he, you know, through his PR, the PIO, the public information officer, like he was always busy and, you know, couldn't make himself available. But, but uh, Glenn Scott and Mike McCartney, they, they both, yeah, I mean, they, they talked to me about the multiple meetings they had with him and, you know, what he wanted them to do. And, and basically like he wanted them to come out and publicly say like, who Honua is a good project. Um, you know, this this would be good for the state. Um, you know, I mean, I don't think he specifically said like, you know, the PUC should should approve it, but I mean, he definitely, you know, wanted their endorsement and felt like, you know, these top level state officials, if they were to come out and say it was a good project, that that kind that might carry some weight with the PUC. That that was definitely the intent of his efforts. Um, you mentioned you know, uh, in, uh, Scott Glenn. But then the uh, state, uh, the chief state energy office. I remember something in your article about how uh, Kevin Johnson was um, was working on articles that were issued by Scott Glenn. Tell, can you tell us a story about that? Well, uh, Huhu Nua was um, running, getting ready to run some radio ads, um, and he he actually asked Scott Glenn to look at the the scripts for the radio ads and, you know, help improve them or fact check them. And, um, you know, and Scott, Scott did that, you know, he sent back some, some suggestions for edits and things like that. Um, and I know that this was in the article too, that Kevin, you know, came to Scott with like a draft memorandum of understanding um, between the state and Huhonua, where, you know, he wanted the state to say that like they were going to provide, you know, these invasive species, these trees like um, strawberry guava and albizia, like, you know, 
because so the Big Island hat does have a problem with these invasive trees, and you know it's like what what are we going to do with these things? And so the goal was okay if we have a draft memorandum in place to to indicate that the state is going to provide all these these trees that we want to get rid of that could be burned at Huhonua, like that would be yet more like support. It would show that the state you know sees the value in this plant. And um, but Scott didn't he didn't sign off on this memorandum of understanding because he didn't really see any any um, real place or role for the state energy office to play when it comes to invasive species management. So he, he basically said, you know, the one you really need to convince is the PUC. It's not my office. So he didn't sign off on it. That was correct. Well, I guess one, one thing that comes to mind is uh, with all of these meetings, all of these contacts, all of these um, well, it walk-ins, um, you know, and personal attempts to, um, you know, get people to support the Uhonua project. Would you say from your reporting that his efforts were successful, that he actually changed the minds of the officials who he approached? No. I mean, the PUC hasn't approved it, and... The people he, you know, made outreach to, at least these top, you know, officials of the EGA administration, they they didn't do what he wanted them to do, which was to, you know, publicly endorse Huho Nua and, you know, Jennifer John or Jennifer Potter, you know, voted against it. So it's hard to see what he's really accomplished, I guess. But, um, you know, there was, there was a couple of meetings you mentioned in your article where Kevin Johnson uh, organized um meetings uh, of local residents on uh, the Big Island and mm -hmm. try to get their support. Um, but as I recall from your article, uh, they were not impressed. What was the general consensus of the people you spoke with regarding his you know, effectiveness in these meetings? Um, well, the ones that I managed to contact, um, you know, they thought he was well-spoken. You know, he's a very magnetic, you know, charismatic guy. He's, he's kind of, you know, he, he does have that kind of star power. Um, but I didn't get the sense that people were really buying what he was offering. Um, you know, there's one woman who attended who was trying to get him to answer some technical questions about the project. And, you know, he didn't really deliver on that. Um, he even said in his deposition in the in that lawsuit that he's he's not into the technical stuff. Like that's not his bailiwick. Um, you know, his, his role is like relationship building and, um, you know, just winning people over so that they will, you know, come on his side and and support the project. So and some of them, some of them uh, related to you that they didn't know why he was there, what role he was playing. Uh, and they were confused as to why this person uh, should have organized a community meeting and come and talk to them and try to get this support. And it was not clear what his relationship was um, with the project. Am I right? Yeah. Uh, I mean, there was one gentleman in particular who lives in the neighborhood near Huhonua who was just kind of baffled about why this, you know, former mayor of, Cal of Sacramento, California, former NBA star would be, you know, talking at a public meeting in a in a small town in uh, the Big Island about a, a tree burning process. Like, it just didn't really make much sense. Um, and he asked him after the meeting, like, what is your role? And and Kevin apparently told him, like, it's to meet people, to shake people's hands. And, um, and the guy said, yeah, well, that's what he did. I mean, he shook my hand and he moved around the room and he was shaking other people's hands. So, um, you know, that's kind of what what he was doing and you know the guy said well that, that seems like a strange line of work but whatever <laughs> okay strange line of work your reporting indicated that for um meeting people and shaking hands he was getting fifty thousand dollars a month now, let me do the math on that that's six hundred thousand dollars a year um it sounds like a really terrific job plus he had a what some kind of percentage interest uh, in the project. Can you talk about it? Um, yes. I, I mean, that was in the court filings. I mean, that was um, 
that fig those figures were listed in a filing made by Harold Robinson's attorneys. So when I ran that by Jennifer Johnson, I said, is, you know, is he still making that or was he making that at the time? And she, she said that she wouldn't put much stock into those numbers because, you know, they were provided by, um, you know, the, the plaintiff's attorneys. Um, so I, I did ask her like, guy, well, Robinson, the one who sued her for wrong yeah, determination. Yeah. They were not friends. Yeah. Not at that point. No, they had a big falling out. Um, but I did ask her, like, well, what is he making now? And, and do you want to set the record straight on those numbers? And, you know, she 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 declined. I mean, she basically she said she didn't know what they were and, and that they go to his company anyway. And she stressed that, like, they don't go directly to Kevin Johnson. They go to his company and there's many people working at the company. You know, so it was. um yeah, I tried to press her to get me, you know, like, what is the figure he's making? You know? and, and then she did say, like, well, why do you want to know that? Or And I said, well, I think people in Hawaii or anywhere really are interested in what, what do lobbyists really make, you know, and um, for for a lot of working people, like, you know, 20, you know, 50 grand a month is that's like strong, strong change in the pocketbook. You know, so I, I was personally interested in it, but, you know, she she didn't want to reveal anything about the the actual figure. According to Robinson, uh, his uh, I think it was a five percent share. I I saw right. in your article. Have, yeah, in uh, addition to the fifty grand, to millions of dollars. Yeah, um, well, she said, you know, this this project will never make any money. You know, it's a big money loser, and you know, she just said there'll there'll never be any project up. So he was, according to that document, in addition to the fifty grand a month, he was supposed to get five um, percent of any project upside, meaning like you know, if it made money, he would get a five percent stake. Um, and you know, Robinson's attorneys were saying like, you know, Jennifer stands to make, you know, millions of dollars on this. Like it's a, it's a great project. And yet her attorneys were saying like, this is a total money pit, you know, it's like a sinkhole for cash. And like, like they were trying to really downplay that this project would ever make money. Um, and she actually kind of confirmed that. I mean, she said, even if this project does go forward, um, she'll never recoup the amount of money she's put into it. And, uh, you know, it's just been a really painful um, yeah. process for her to be involved with. Well, this is like a um, 20 or 30 year um, agreement here uh, where she would earn uh, money, whatever it was, over a long period of time. And I guess the upside would be the upside over that period of 20 or 30 years. That turns into a lot of money because, as you said, um, this 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 energy would have been above market, it would have cost the people on the Big Island more than other sources of um, energy. But yes, me, but she, me, go ahead. well, I was just going to say she disputed that. She took issue with that um, critique of the project that, you know, the energy would actually be more expensive. She said that when those calculations were done, it was um, when oil prices were like really really um, low, I think. And anyway, she was like with the war in Ukraine and um, with oil prices, you know, being what they are now that she doesn't think that that figure, you know, that it would add $11 to people's monthly bills is accurate. So she, she disputed that. Mm. So um, last, you know, last time I looked, uh, she had, she said she'd put in $400 million in this project. But um, in your article, it, it was $500 million. So whatever it is, uh, seems to be going up a hundred million per annum somehow. Um, but uh, with all of that investment, and then she tells you he's not going to make any money on it. And she's actually a long way from getting the approval that she hired Kevin Johnson to get. Um, why do you understand? Do you know, does she tell you why he continues to, to flog this position? Um, why is she so determined uh, to make this happen, to get the approval to, you know, make the project happen when she herself says, I'll never make any money on it? Um, I mean, she told me she still believes in the project. She thinks that, um, you know, the Big Island needs a, a diverse energy portfolio and that, you know, battery or solar plus battery and wind just, you know, aren't aren't reliable enough or, you know, firm enough to um, to 
you know, get the island to where it needs to be. And, you know, she also talked about, you know, the jobs that Huhonua would create for, or, I mean, they actually, there are actually people working there and, and they, they have been working there all during the pandemic. She was very, she definitely wanted to get that message out that, you know, she's been, she's employed them, you know, for a long time, even through the pandemic, even though the plant isn't open and and these are good, well-paying jobs with 401ks and health insurance and all that. Um, you know, she also said like, if it gets into operation, there'll be, it'll be a real boost to like a forestry industry on the Island because the plant would burn these eucalyptus trees that are, you know, growing on the Island. And, you know, she just what plugged I the different that is that she, She's not going to make any money herself, but it's going to help other people on the Island. Um, is that something that you could accept from your reporting? Um, I mean, you know, honestly, I'm I am not an energy expert. I'm just I'm a general assignment reporter. So, I mean, I I, I don't think I'm really in a position at this point, at least to say whether, you know, her, her claims are valid or not. But, um, you know, you asked me why she stays committed to the project. And I mean, this is what she told me. Mm -hmm. So the last question I have for you, because Marco has some questions about the permitting issue, your other article, and we'll go to that in a minute. But my last question for you, Paula, is. You know, um, are you satisfied um, that you got to the bottom of what you were looking for? Are you satisfied that you found what you were reporting for, what you were investigating for? And if not, what would you say um, you're, you, you, you were unable to get? What was missing? What is missing? Because I know, you know, there's a fair chance you'll write on this again. There should be. Um, but what else is out there that you would investigate? Um, well, I mean, I, I think, you know, it's kind of the classic journalism yarn that, you know, you, you follow the money and, and obviously there's, there's been a lot of money that's put, put into this project. Um, maybe there's a lot of money to be made, um, you know, even off of, I mean, there's going to be more lawsuits, I'm sure, uh, you know, and, you know, maybe there's settlements out there where, Money can be recouped. So I think that there's just a lot of questions about um, just the money aspect of this. And then, of course, there's, you know, there were um, some attempts at legislation last session, uh, these bills that would have benefited Huhonua. Um, you know, why were those introduced? Um, you know, were there were there any promises made like, hey, if, if this bill gets passed, you know, you'll reap a reward. I mean, I, I'm not trying to imply anything, um, but I just feel like the world of lobbying is is murky and, you know, it, it can be hard to prove things. And so, no, I mean, I'm not entirely satisfied by what I was able to accomplish with the article, but at least I feel like it sheds some light on, um, you know, some of the inner workings, like how who how knew a is attempting to go about, you know, the outcome that it wants to see. So, um, you well, know, uh, you know, there are a lot of people in town who were surprised uh, to find what you wrote about. They didn't know this. They didn't know the extent of the lobbying, the extent of uh, Hu Nua's efforts uh, to, uh, to approach individual officials and legislators. Um, mm -hmm. So it, it's really quite remarkable what you came came up with. And uh, compliments to you, uh, kudos to Civil Beat uh, for doing this investigative report again, um, you know, gi giving us the revelations that you have given us. So well, thank, thank you. you. Uh, on behalf of everyone I know uh, in the community, thank you very much, Paula, for that. Thank you. Appreciate that. Marco, your turn. Thank you. Uh, just kind of one little factoid here. I actually was on the receiving end of uh, Kevin Johnson reaching out to me via email a long, long time ago. Uh, somehow I got on his radar screen. I thought, well, this is interesting. He must know very little about me as far as my uh, publicly coming out against the plant a long time ago. So once I let him know that, uh, any communication thereafter ceased. So I thought I would add that. Uh, I wanted to uh, talk to you, Paula, about uh, your most recent piece, the one that came out regarding the, uh, the mess, regarding permitting. And a uh, little bit of background. I've known Warren Lee for more than 22 years. He, in fact, was my boss for several years when ProVision was part of Point Electric Industries. So yeah, I worked under him and got to know him, at least to some degree. 
And then he had eight years as Department of Public Works chief under one Mayor Billy Kanoy. And I was astonished, astonished and stunned at uh, what went down, apparently, under his watch. Now, Warren, as far as I know, no longer lives on the Big Island, hasn't lived on the Big Island for a number of years now, was essentially called brought out of quasi-retirement by Jennifer Johnson and her Who Who Knew project, and he's been at that now for a number of years. But I, I was stunned. I was stunned at what went down under Warren's watch, and I reread the letter from the current DPWP uh, chief, Steve Paz, before we went on the air today, and I was uh, I was kind of stunned by his language as well. I mean, that you had, and I'm a contractor. I've been a contractor now going for 20 years. So I know the game that is played with the county. I know the permitting game. I have to, and I have to get it right. Otherwise, my company doesn't survive. So I know something about the contracting, and I know something about Warren. I know something about Hu Honua. And I put all these knowing somethings together. I'm just, I'm dealing with the question of how in the world one Warren Lee with all his cred, all his smarts, all his experience could allow all this stuff to go down on his watch. And, and the stuff that I read from Steve Paz, these were not trivial matters of noncompliance. These were very substantive. So it just boggles my mind as to how this could have happened under Warren. So you spoke to Warren. You've had some exchanges with Warren. What kind of hit or vibe energy do you get from him other than, oh, well, these are trivial. You know, we're dealing with it, minor oversights or what, however you tried to spin it. Were you able to get any more insight into how this happened under Warren's watch at Huhonua? Well, he claims that, you know, the paperwork was all submitted and that it got lost um, at the county level when the county switched over from one um, building permit software program to another. Um, so, I mean, he didn't concede anything as far as what they have or haven't done, like as far as in his mind, like this is all on the county and and uh, but, you know, but we'll we'll get it all straightened out. You know, we'll resubmit um, what, what needs to be resubmitted and you know, it'll all be taken care of. Um, so, you know, that's that's kind of what he said. And, you know, I I don't know. I, I really don't know exactly. Um, you know, I, I don't work at the county. I mean, I can just tell you what the DPW director, like he didn't he didn't buy that at all. Like because I after Warren, you know, told me that I, I did go back to Steve Posse and, you know, said, well, you know, could this actually be a matter of missing paperwork that like with the software program change that it just got lost? And he just said, no, that that's just not plausible. Um, you know, he said that um, a lot of these um, the way a lot of this worked out was that it was like verbal agreements that, um, you know, that that who knew I had verbal agreements with the previous DPW leadership and um you know, um, that's how some of this was able to go forward. Um, and then, you know, there's also the question about incremental permitting, like, like Warren said that that's, that's kind of the way it was being approached was like, you know, you could build certain structures or, you know, refurbish certain structures and, you know, get a permit here and a permit there. Like you didn't have to have it all completed and then submit the whole finished thing to the county to get, you know, one big sign off. It was kind of like done in stages and and, um, you know, that, that a lot of it is still in the works. And, um, that's, yeah, that's so funny. anyway. Uh, that's funny, it's Paula, mess. because, um, you know, we've had other shows about this. Um, and it, uh, the newspaper articles that, that we've seen, I've seen, uh, suggest that the, the project is just about complete. Just about mm -hmm. complete. So the idea of incremental permits doesn't really work when the project is just about complete. Yeah, they do say it's about 99% complete. Um, but, you know, if you read the, the latest um, exchange between the EPW and Warren, like the, the county wrote him again on December 9th, I want to say, like, kind of reminding of these upcoming deadlines to get things submitted. And, um, you know, they're 
you know, they're basically saying like these are critical deadlines and there's, you know, critical steps that need to be taken now. Um, so it's it'll be interesting to see how it plays out. I mean, there's obviously um, some tension there between, you know, this new DPW director who just started. I think it was over the summer. Um, and, uh, you know, it seems like they're they're trying to make things go according to, you know, you have to st stick to the book and like do things, you know, this way. There's a process. Um, and it sounds like the way that it was handled previously was according to a different process, perhaps a little bit looser or, you know, whatever. But um, yeah, I think the, the building division chief, she called it a, uh, quote, huge mess. So we'll have to see how that plays out. Why do I feel there's another story in that? <laughs> well, they have um, these upcoming deadlines in February uh, to March to get this sorted out. So it'll be, yeah, it'll be interesting to see what, what ultimately happens. Um, so, but yeah, I mean, but even if the permits, the county permits do get granted, I mean, it still, you know, needs to go back to the PUC. Um you know, like it's not going to operate unless the PUC signs off on it. Now, the constitution of the PUC has changed quite a bit lately, as you know, like there's a new uh, commissioner and, you know, uh, and another, well, there's two new commissioners and uh, the chair has changed, you know, since Jay Griffin stepped down. So, you know, if it does go back to the PUC, it might may meet a more favorable reception than it did the last time around. One last question before we go, we do got to go. Um, Let me make a couple points, quick points, please. Just one, just this one question. Um, do you have any information from your reporting uh, that Uho Nua or Kevin Johnson approached any other commissioner then or more recently on this issue? Um, I haven't. No, I haven't really. I don't know if he's doing that now or not. I, I haven't really looked into it. I just kind of wanted to get that one story written and get it out the door. Um, I you know, since he's not talking to me, um, you know, I, it's hard to know, but uh, it's a good question. It's mm. a good question. Sorry, Marco, your, your turn to wrap up. Yes, yeah, a couple, couple of quick things. Uh, uh, one factoid is that to my knowledge, maybe Paul, you know differently, to my knowledge, Mayor Mitch Roth of the, the island has declined, refused, has, has not publicly taken a stance regarding who whole new ones. Uh, I've tried myself. I've questioned subordinates, and he has. I can find no record whatsoever of Mitch Roth saying yes or no on it, uh, which I find kind of disappointing on such a high-profile project. And the second thing I wanted to point out is that you know, one of who only was talking points over the years has been, "Look what a good neighbor we are. Look at what we do for the community. Look what we will do for the community." And to me. Uh, not being in compliance with uh, multiple permits and being on the subject of fines, uh, one could argue, I think, pretty persuasively that this belies the notion of good neighborliness on the part of Uhonua. Good neighbors don't do things like that. The contractors who, who are going by the book and playing the game the way it needs to be played don't do stuff like that. So I think that's... Uh, Again, I just find it puzzling that, that this would all happen under Warren's watch. So uh, well, this, this has been a, a super, super interesting, valuable, and a worthwhile time to spend with you, Paula, and you as well, Jay. So I uh, just want to thank you very much for being on with us. And uh, hopefully uh, your reporting will continue on the subject, and uh, uh, you can join us again sometime. Thank you, Paula. Yeah. No worries. And, thank you, guys. And thank you, Marco. Aloha to you both. Aloha. Thank you both. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, 
Instagram, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.